Sure, then uh, it's time now. So we will welcome other people as they join. So let's start the session. So hello and uh, welcome to this special edition of Let's Talk Business. As always, I'm super excited to have you here. And first of all, thanks a lot for joining us in this session, in this very special session. So for those who are who joined us first time, this is our second webinar in this series. In our first webinar, we discussed some of the fundamental of Lloyds of London and largely covered, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about those various stakeholders. We also touched briefly about the various modernization activities which is happening within the Lloyds of London. And Amit Pasrija was, uh, you know, giving the session. In this webinar session, we are going uh, and talking specifically about the London insurance and reinsurance market as a whole. We are briefly going to touch about it, touch about this subject, and then we will move on to the real, you know, real part of the session where we are covering the risk placement processes. In this, we will try to learn about various different way of doing business and we will cover about the delegate authorities, open market and line slip. These are the very specific terms used in London market. And then we will also go and talk about the the claim processes, how the claim has been handled in the London market. And London market is, you know, specifically famous of handling their claims. Right. So this webinar shall be useful for insurance and uh, you know insurance and insurance related IT professionals and for those who are preparing for some sort of certification in London market here you will get a lot of insight like how things are happening within the London market and I must say that this is a very unique platform right so this session is scheduled for one hour out of which 45 minutes is going to be on the presentation and the expert talk and remaining 15 minutes for the Q&A session so if you are if you are not able to answer all your Q and A's, then no worries. We will I will take those uh, questions and then we will reply those questions on on the Let's Talk Business YouTube channel, right? So going forward, so we have a very special person today, and uh, he's an industry expert. His name is Sumanta Bag. Sumanta Bag is going to share his experience and knowledge with us in this session. Subanta, thanks a lot for joining us and giving your valuable time. Could you please introduce yourself to the wider audience so that we can understand you better? And then probably from there, we can take it forward. Subanta, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can. I can. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry, I was talking on mute. I mean, no worries. It happens. It's over to you, Samantha. Most of the online meetings here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So many thanks, Ravi, and and um, hello everyone. Thanks for joining in today. Um, I am Sumanta, and I am currently associated with WNS Global, uh, part of the operations uh, team over there. Uh, these operations processes are based on all the London market, uh, you know, uh, clients that we have. Um, in the past, I have been associated with uh, um, and have gained rich experience from companies like CSC, Exchanging and Genpact. And uh, I think I would take this opportunity to thank Ravi for this, um, for, for this, uh, you know, um, ch chance for me to be part of this, this, this uh, amazing platform. Uh, I think Ravi, this is to be honest, this is an uh, amazing initiative that you have taken and the journey uh, by providing us all a platform to interact with people um, who we are not associated with and thereby learning from each other's knowledge and experience. And uh, as Ankit correctly mentioned, this is an amazing uh, you know, place to be um, at. All right. So, thank yeah, you. thank you so much. Um, over to you.
Oh yeah, I'm really sorry. Again, I forgot to mute, unmute myself. <laughs> okay. So well, <laughs> well, uh, before starting our session, what uh, I was I was saying that we are experiencing a lot of change in the London market, specifically during this pandemic time. Okay. And London market is pushing really hard to modernize some of these business processes and IT systems, and few of them like you know developing a lot of APIs so that they can accept business, you know, uh, uh, real time. You know digitally which was not happening earlier and uh, the ppl they are they are increasing the ppl ppl is a system which they use to accept the risk so samantha will talk about it later so so it's a it's a very exciting time and we are experiencing a lot of uh, changes in this market in this great market so the idea is to have these sessions uh, you know uh, more and more of this kind of a session so that we can all understand what is happening in this market and learn from each other right so now i'm not going to hold this session for more i'm going to hand over this session to sumanta and uh, sumanta this session is to you now please i'm going to take your notes and i'm going to check on the on the all the questions which we are getting sumanta over to you now perfect perfect thank you ravi thank you so much um welcome everyone uh, i i take this as an opportunity to be able to interact uh, with you all and share my experience. Uh, I cannot say that I am a champion. Uh, I'm still learning because this is a mysterious market where nobody can say that somebody is an expert, right? So the construct of this session is, you know, uh, we will briefly talk about the history of this market. I know everybody would have you know, gone through this a lot of the time. But just to set the context, I'll, I'll just quickly touch upon it. And then um, uh, I'll talk more about how risks are placed in the market and how claims is managed, you know, and probably uh, not a very detailed one at a high level. Um, so should we move to the next, next uh, slide, please? Perfect. Um, also, today we have two special guests with us, uh, and they are Melina and Brian, who you can see on the slide, and they will be guiding us through um, our today's session. Uh, Melina is a uh, service line broker in the US, and Brian is a, a Lloyd's broker, or rather a London market broker, and uh, they would be, you know, um, doing this journey uh, or may, would be along with us through this journey. Um, next so one. Before before going, uh, Sumanta, to the next slide, right, I really wanted to understand why you have selected the the London market broker. What is so special about Brian? Well, Brian is special because Brian is a London market uh, broker and uh, a broker is actually the gateway to the London market. Why do I say that? Because London market is a is a specialized market and uh, uh, very very you know specialized risks are being placed, high value risks are being placed, you know, and uh, uh, the insured or or any other broker who are not part of the London market would have uh, you know would be would find very very difficult to uh, find the right underwriter or the right carrier who would be able to you know uh, underwrite such unique risks. Um, and therefore, underwriter, sorry, the London market brokers play a very, very important role in the market. Um, and this is how it has been right since the inception. And they have, uh, the brokers have also developed um, an expertise uh, of, of the sort that, you know, they, they compete with the underwriters uh, and they actually help uh, underwriters uh, take the decision on the risk, uh, which are good decisions on the risk. And they help the client to get the best value out of, uh, you know, uh, the market. So, yeah, that is why I think uh, I have Brian with us today. Should we move on to the next slide, please? All right. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, as a use case for today, you know, what we are doing is uh, one of the... Uh, 
insured based out of the us has approached their local broker and since uh, the kind of insurance they are looking for uh, was not available um, in that market so they reached out to a surplus line broker which is milena and milena has uh, subsequently reached out to brian to help um, her place the risk in the london market yeah so this is the construct of our session today uh, if we go to the next one right so uh, i'll start with a very very brief history and um, and everybody of you would agree that insurance in some form and is as old as a, as as our historical societies um, and so called bottomary contracts were known to merchants of babylon as early as 4000 to 3000 bc uh, bottomary was also practiced by the hindus in 600 bc and was well understood in ancient greece as well yeah. so uh, it dates back to you know uh, the ancient times to be honest now when we talk about london market no discussion of the early development of the insurance in europe uh, would be complete without reference to the lloyds of london and uh, the international this is the international insurance market um, we all know it began in the 17th century at a coffee house patronized by merchants and bankers and insurance underwriters gradually becoming recognized as the most likely place to find insur underwriters for marine insurance Edward Lloyd supplied his customers with shipping information gathered from the docks and other sources those days and which eventually grew into the publication called Lloyd's List and this is uh, still uh, existent. Um, and Lloyd's was uh, recognized in 1769 as a formal group of underwriters accepting marine risk. Yeah. So what is so distinct about the London market? London market is distinct and, and it's a separate part of the UK insurance and reinsurance industry. And centered in the city of London, um, its main participants are insurance, reinsurance companies, uh, Lloyds of London, uh, PNI clubs, and brokers who, who handle most of the businesses. Um, the core of its activities is conducted, uh, is a conduct of internationally traded insurance and reinsurance business. Um, and this is mostly non-life insurance and reinsurance. Uh, particularly marine and aviation business uh, with an increased emphasis on high exposure risks. Uh, over the centuries, this market has developed and grown and today it is the largest global hub for commercial and specialty risk, uh, delivering solutions for risk in almost every territory around the world. Yeah. Um, it's a genuine uh, market offering an ecosystem of about uh, 350 insurance carriers, brokers, and affiliated uh, professional services working within that uh, one square mile of the city of London. So this high concentration of insured, uh, insurance related intellectual capital and depth of experience combined with the unique face-to-face -face trading that takes place is what makes London a world's leading global insurance market. Um, so probably you know if you look at it um, about 60 of uh, the carriers are, are associated with iua and 99 are, are uh, uh, lloyd syndicates okay next so i, yes. I got a question yes. you know i i got a real Sorry, question. yes yes so how about this new and different risk? You know, we know that London market is quite innovative in many ways. So when when you say yeah. that, especially for new and different risk, what do we, what do you mean by that? Can you give some example? You know, for us to correlate. Yeah, I mean probably, and um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, and I think uh, this would make it clear that uh, why why London market leads by example. So uh, we are in this pandemic situation, right? COVID nineteen uh, pandemic and um, countries all the countries are in a race to to uh, develop the vaccine and uh, which uh, eventually would be developed by any any of the countries you know who are everybody's trying for it now Lloyd, lloyds of london has um, you know come up with this new uh, syndicate uh, which is syndicate named 1796 
and they have created the syndicate uh, from their syndicate in a box concept and this syndicate has been created especially for the purpose of you know um, storing and transportation of covid-19 vaccine right so i i think this is unique you know i mean people are still trying to uh, develop the vaccine uh, but this market has already created a, a, a product which would eventually take care of the storage and uh, transportation of uh, the covid-19 vaccine yeah um, exciting if i have to quote if i have to quote another example you know last year if you were aware you know towards the month of june july uh, iran actually seized a number of uh, you know uh, vessels uh, which belonged to or flag uh, which belonged to different countries and one of the vessels uh, called um, stena was uh, you know seized by them uh, which had which, which which was british flag now uh, that is when hiscox one of the you know syndicates came up with a product called malicious vessel uh, vessel sheezer you know and um, they, res they responded to it as a single peril of a ship taken from by a foreign government providing loss of higher cost and the services of the crisis management consultancy for control risks so this is this is how they you know um, this market reacts to, to new situations therefore i mean therefore i say you know uh, it, this market is very very innovative there can be more examples but then uh, does that answer your question ravi no absolutely absolutely i mean this is a this is a most uh, innovative market so uh, so yeah yeah uh, all good okay okay moving on um, i think uh, like every insurance market right uh, is is uh, regular uh, regulated market uh, similarly uh, london market is also a regulated market and uh, it used to be fsa now uh, fsa was divided into fca and pra uh, with specific uh, roles and responsibilities FCA regulates the conduct and behavior of financial firms and work with them to ensure consumers are treated fairly. So their main aim is to ensure that the consumers are treated fairly. While as the PRA supervises the financial firms to ensure uh, they provide products that are safe and sound, and they also look at uh, at, at the financial stability of these uh, FIs or the insurance companies. all right so um with i mean uh, we have looked into the you know um, history of the london market and how innovative this london market is so let's start uh, with you know placing the risk in the london market uh, so brian will now help melina place a risk in the london market yeah so before we start placing risk in the london market uh, we need to understand uh, and everybody would agree that you know risks are of different types some would be you know fairly simple risk uh, some would be medium complex risk and some would be highly complex risks so the london market caters to all type of risk and they have come up with different way of placing these risks in the market so when the risk is of sim very simple in nature and uh, would i mean when the risks are very simple in nature it would be uh, the volumes would be very high uh, so those kind of risks are placed on a binding authority basis or a delegated authority under through delegated underwriting where the carrier or the uh, underwriter in the london market would uh, delegate their authority to a third party or or it can be another uh, underwriter it can be another agency it can be a broker who is competent enough to to underwrite risk on behalf of uh, the syndicate or the underwriter or the carrier when the risks become a little complex where um, it is still a delegate delegated authority sort of thing but then the underwriter would need some uh, more control over the selection of the risks then these kind of risks are you know placed in the market uh, through line slips so we'll discuss the uh, these concepts in, in the later slides and and when the risks are highly complex where uh, you know the underwriters needs to definitely look at uh, all the aspects before they agree to a risk then those risks are placed uh, uh, as an open market risks 
okay so these are the three i mean basically three ways uh, uh, the risk can be placed in the market apart from that reinsurance risks are also placed then we'll keep that out of uh, uh, context for this session next one so let's start with the open market placement so as as i mentioned you know uh, when the risks are complex and and it has to be assessed properly uh, by the underwriters you know that is when uh, the risks would be placed as an open market on an open market basis uh, as and and uh, ravi to your question you know uh, why london market and brokers are so important in the london market uh, so london market is a very very close knit market you know and and um, there's there's a great professional network that goes on a uh, lot of these hap happens on a relationship basis as well relationship between the underwriter and the broker uh, it's, so it's a relationship driven market um, also london market is is uh, famous for being the subscription market uh, what i mean by subscription market is where uh, multiple underwriters can subscribe to one single risk and that would happen because the size of the risk uh, are huge and, and these kind of, these risks are very very complex um, to give in, give you an example a satellite launch um, can be one of the examples where uh, the size of the risk is very very huge therefore no, no single underwriter would have the capacity to you know underwrite such risk or they would not be willing to do so because of the fact that you know if there's there's a claim uh, it can be uh, you know uh, very very devastating for them yeah also the brokers you know um, understand the market so well that they know what type of risks uh, i mean who are the underwriters who are expert in certain type of risk and who are the underwriters who are innovative and they can you know underwrite or look at underwriting some unusual unusual risks as well right um and and the brokers also play a very very important role when it comes to claims management on behalf of their client because uh, they need to ensure that the claims are being paid on time uh, appropriate claims are being up, uh, up authorized and paid out to their clients so uh, that is why the brokers actually play a very very important no i think you as you said rightly i think this is a very you know very unique uh, uh, very unique thing in london market where broker is so much involved in 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 managing claims you know right from the day one to the to the uh, to the day of settlement so they are so much integrated in their processes right then it is very hard to imagine uh, the 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 business without them correct samanda that's correct yeah yeah that's absolutely correct yeah yeah should we go on to the next slide please yeah all right so now let's try and place a open market risk uh, because the risk is quite complex therefore uh, you know uh, brian would need to place it on an open market basis when i say open market open market is a situation where a complex risk is placed um uh, into into the london market and it would be i mean it may be most of the time it may be you know uh, subscribed by multiple parties or multiple uh, underwriters um therefore brian would need to you know create a, a um, document which would capture all the risk details and take it to uh, a different underwriters so brian being an expert uh, broker in the london market he would be aware or he is rather aware that you know who are the underwriters who would be you know ready or willing to uh, write certain uh, the risk that he wants to place on on behalf of melina uh, so he would go uh, you know approach different underwriters multiple underwriters uh, uh, in order to place the risk so this is the traditional way of you know doing business or placing risk in the london market since 2016 the market has been trying to you know uh, uh, implement uh, digitize and they are, they are bringing a lot of change as you mentioned you know and and there, there a lot of digitization digital initiatives are going on a lot of form projects are being run to ensure that they are able to you know uh, make this market or the london market processes more lean and efficient yeah so in order to do that uh they started with this uh, uh, you know concept of electronic placement uh, through risk syndication 
and uh, they they created this you know placing uh, place uh, platform placing platform limited ppl uh, to do so although initially the response was not very good because the underwriters and the brokers you know were so used to the traditional way of doing business that they would not accept it uh, but over a period of time you know uh, the market uh, started realizing the benefit and real started uh, realizing the importance of going digital and going lean and come 2020 march you know uh, the pandemic covid 19 pandemic uh, you know uh, ensured that all the market was locked down and people started uh, working from home and that is when the ppl um, the usage of ppl surged uh, to an extent where uh, if you can look at the slide you know almost 60 percent of of the uh, risks placed uh, in the market uh, for the lloyd syndicate uh, and and 51 percent of the risks uh, placed in the market were for the uh, uh, company markets uh, company market insurers right and we also have the list of the top five syndicates who uh, were um, who clocked more than 70 percent uh, of usage of the london market uh, sorry ppl placement uh, in the market right so um, as, as a broker uh, these days uh, they would uh, the broker would be required to you know enter all the risk details into the ppl platform and attached all the information uh, or, or, or uh, information available related to the risk and uh, they can electronically send it to all the underwriters that they want this risk to be placed with uh, therefore uh, you know this is how the people have started working um, i hope that you know the market continues to uh, use ppl and uh, you know uh, use the other electronic modes of uh, operations and transactions so that it can become a much more efficient market in the long run okay so yeah. going to the next slide so yeah, as, a, as a broker yeah, yeah. just uh, wanted to add i mean simanta uh, samantha if you allow me for uh, yes please to share my so say for example you know i'm i'm tracking this the ppl and uh, recently lma which is a governing body of lords right they have uh, they have acquired 40 percent in the ppl so the ppl right the the system which is used to place the risk electronically into the market is is now started gaining a lot of traction you know and they are investing this platform heavily and this this is a platform uh, where uh, which also plays a very central part in their modernization program called future of lloyd future at lloyd's yeah. you know they are doing a lot of things you know improving in this platform you know to improvising this platform so that they can this platform can deliver a lot of value going forward and covid situation this pandemic situation actually give them a what you say a very right a very uh, bright chance to evaluate the way they can use the electronic system to place the place the risk what what do you think sumanta do you agree with me yeah absolutely and and uh, that is why i said uh, i hope that you know once the lloyds uh, opens up uh, their activities from office or the lloyds building from 1st of september i i really hope that you know um, the market continues to use uh, the platform all the digital platforms you know i think there are a lot of digital interventions being you know put across in the market to make it much more efficient and cost effective operationally um, so yeah I, I think that is the way uh, forward as well so i just wanted to take a pause for a minute here and just wanted to ask if somebody wanted to ask anything at this moment or shall we go ahead and uh, discuss the remaining slide uh, <clears throat> hi ravi i'm the camera this side so i hope you can hear me yeah yes i'm um, we were talking about uh, the binding authority so i just wanted to know what's the difference between the binding authority and the cover holder or uh, basically they are the same uh, i mean there are two different terms for them or they are totally different so 
so I just wanted to understand the difference between the cover holder and binding authority. Sure, Samantha, okay. over to you. Yeah, so should we? Uh, um, okay, okay, let me take this uh, question. So, yes, binding authority, cover holder, you know, um, are used in the same context. So, what happens, the way it works is, you know, um, when a similar type of risks has to uh, are being placed in the market, you know, uh, the underwriter uh, would approach a broker to uh, create a binding um, underwrite uh, binding authority arrangement. You know, so by this arrangement, they actually delegate uh, uh, their authority of underwriting risks for for that particular class of business to to a third party, and that third party could be a broker, an agent, and can be another. Uh, managing agent or, or an insurer as well. So the person who has the authority to underwrite risk um, uh, uh, under the you know binding authority is known as the cover holder. So yes, cover holder, delegated underwriting, binding authority um, are are you know uh, are are words or you know uh, terms associated with the same concept of delegating. And delegated and the writing authority. So okay. So, so me, basically, basically, they are synonymous. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, actually, when I was yeah. learning this thing, I, I most of the time I used to get confused. You know, so how I learned yeah. this? Cover holder, the person, the company who is holding the cover uh, on, on the basis or on the behalf of somebody else, you know, is is a cover holder. So here, company yes. A is holding some sort of uh, coverage. I mean, authority to provide coverage on the behalf of some other company is called a cover holder, uh, right, Samantha? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move ahead. Yeah, Ashwarya. This is Ashwarya. Yeah. Hi, sir. I want to say that uh, what Samantha wants to, wants to say is, uh, cover holder is the person. Who is bound in that uh, binding authority contract? Is it right what I've understood? And binding authority is the contract. Yeah, so the binding authority is the contract between the cover holder and the underwriter who has delegated the authority to the cover holder to underwrite business. Does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So they are authorized to write risk on behalf of someone else. Um, is that right? Yeah. yeah, that's correct. So, if so, for example, if you are an underwriter in the Lloyd's London market, and if I am the broker, uh, you approach me to you know create a delegated uh, authority. So, I would be as a broker would be responsible for creating or helping you find a cover holder who would write risk on your behalf. So, I'll maybe you know approach uh, Ravi, and um, knowing that Ravi is a competitive uh, you know uh, competent uh, cover holder, so. I can, you know, get both of you together, you know, so there would be a contract between yourself and Ravi, uh, where Ravi would be writing insurance on your behalf. So Ravi is a cover holder, you are the, you know, person who has delegated your underwriting authority, and the contract between uh, you and Ravi is the under, you know, binding authority. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, one more thing, sorry. So, uh, what about the service companies? They are also kind of same thing, or uh, they are different in any way. Service companies are also same thing. The diff the basic difference between a cover holder and a service company is 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 you know service company is always a wholly owned subsidy of of that uh, particular insurer, while as a cover holder can be a cover holder for many other uh, underwriters, right? And they are typically known as MGA, Managing General Agents, who are cover holders for you know multiple underwriters. So they are not bound with one single underwriter to you know underwrite risk on their behalf. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. You're so welcome. Natesh here. Yeah. Yeah. Natesh. So can we say that if company A has provided an authority to a particular broker, suppose X broker? So broker X will be the frontier to the client and actually it is being protected by company A, which is the actual company taking the ownership of the risk. Is it? That's correct. Okay. Okay. 
moving ahead uh, samantha okay perfect all right so uh, as i mentioned uh, the basic difference between the delegated authority uh, is is you know um, in the open market scenario or, or or when the risk is being placed on an open market basis the broker uh, is free to approach um, any underwriter or any number of underwriters who he deems you know are capable of underwriting such kind of risks you know um, so here in this case you know probably uh, uh, these four insurance companies or these four uh, you know syndicates have come together to underwrite the risk that brian is placing on behalf of medina right now so if you say brian is uh, you know uh, notifying melena that he has been able to place 100% of the risk on a subscription basis which means you know melena has asked brian to you know place 100% of the risk while I, whereas the client may you know want their broker to maybe place not 100% maybe less than 100% as well so broker it is broker's obligation or broker's responsibility to ensure that they are able to place uh the risk uh, you know uh, to the extent that they have been asked by their client now um i think uh, the concept of lead and follow is is you know um in in the london market where uh, you know the broker would always have a slip lead um, you know slip lead is a or, or the leader is the underwriter who is an expert in that particular uh, class of business or line of business and uh who would set up the terms and conditions for the risk and to which you know uh, all the other underwriters would agree because of the fact that they understand so for example here uh, hiscox talbot and askert they understand that brit is probably uh, you know an expert in underwriting these kind of risks so they are happy to you know accept the risk on the basis of the terms and conditions um set by uh, the brit syndicate right so brit here is therefore becomes the lead and everyone else follows um so this is the concept of lead and follower now once the risk has been placed 100% um uh, then the broker would normally notify uh, their client and then they would uh, you know start working towards you know um accounting and settlement so uh the life cycle of 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 uh, a risk in the london market is it can be divided into rather two two broader categories pre bind and post bind uh till the time you know risk um, assessed and placed in the market it it is all uh, part of the pre bind stage once the risk has been accepted 100% in the market which means that all underwriters have accepted the risk and the risk becomes bound uh you know legally then uh it moves to a post bind stage right and post bind stage and, and these are important because you know uh, brokers and underwriters you know um, have their operations based out of uh, you know uh, these life cycle or these uh, uh, statuses of each and every risks so typically uh, during a pre bind phase you know um, there would be lot of negotiations that would happen between uh the brokers and the underwriters the underwriters would ask for a lot of informations related to the risks um and uh, you know anybody who's who's uh, you know from the underwriting background or underwriting group in our, in, in this uh, session would understand you know the kind of information an underwriter would ask for from the broker related to the risk before they accept the risk right once they have accepted it then it goes to a post buying phase where um the broker would record the risk information or details uh, risk information in a detailed manner manner in their own systems so that they are able to you know uh, do the accounting and settlement because in the london market broker is responsible for collecting the premium from the uh, client the insured and you know uh, then passing it on to the, uh, underwriters or the market through exchanging so in order to do that the broker would uh, first of all uh enter all the capture all the risk information in their system you know they are also responsible 
responsible for sharing the risk document or the you know insurance document with the client so in order to do that they would they would ensure that they have a I mean, normally a broker would add their own covering letter uh, with the signed slip or the mrc and uh, while doing that they will take away uh, you know um, one section of the mrc which is subscription agreement which we'll talk about um, because that is something which happens between the subscription agreement is between the broker and the underwriter therefore the client does not or the insured does not have to, does not have anything to do with it therefore you know um, they will take this off and then they will send their uh, debit notes uh, to the to the mark, uh, to the clients and subsequently they'll you know submit accounting and settlement request through exchanging so that once you know, uh, exchanging can process those information and exchanging can you know pass on those information uh, to the underwriters and once the broker receives the money from the client they would again pass it on to the on to exchanging and exchanging would that automatically settle it to the underwriters basis the way exchanging has processed it okay yep so hemant yeah. uh, sorry so Manta, just one question yep. from this slide if if brit syndicate and escort has both 30 percent of the uh, subscription or, or or the percentage of the risk which they are yeah. going to manage then how mm. brit will become a lead and escort become a follower is it possible okay, so, like I... yes yeah, i mean see becoming a lead or a follower does not depend on the percentage of risk that you are subscribing for it depends on your expertise so if you are able to you know if if uh, escort is maybe you know suppose uh, melina is placing some some uh, marine uh, risk and if escort is an expert in that marine that kind of marine risk then probably mm -hmm. um, the broker would you know, uh, approach Ascot to be the slip lead rather than you know they would go to Brit. So if Brit, I mean for say for example for this scenario, let's uh, you know um, assume that you know for this particular risk that is being placed into the market, Brit is an expert. Therefore, uh, you know, um, Brian has you know um, asked Brit to be the lead. Now it depends on Brit that. They want to write one percent, five percent, ten percent, or fifty percent, right? So their percentage mm -hmm. would not define if they be a lead or a follower, right? It is the expertise that they have in that particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, class of business, line of business, which would define if somebody would be a lead or a follower. And Ascot and Talbot and Hiscox would not be a follower until and unless they they understand and uh, agree that probably all the terms and conditions set up by brit is something which is the best so you know um, therefore they are following uh, brit right okay. so i think so any sharing is not okay sorry yeah their percentage of share it does not define if somebody can be a, a lead or a follower okay so initially the broker and the particular one insurance or insurance company would be the one who will decide the lead and if the other followers will also agree to the terms and condition then it will be perfectly fine right yeah i mean i mean if we go into details there are a lot of other factors as well you know so probably you know okay uh, say brit and and his cox uh, both are equally good in that particular class of business mm -hmm. so broker would approach everybody right and yeah. whosoever is able to give the broker best you know um, uh, deal uh, brokers mm -hmm. would go for that and that is those are the other factors that would de decide if if you know somebody would be a lead or a follower as well but essentially uh, a follower uh, whosoever is follower they would agree to the concept to, they would agree that the leader is somebody who has who is an expert in that particular class of business and they have uh, you know, set up the right uh, terms and conditions for accepting that risk therefore they would uh, you know agree to be a follower okay samantha so, so, can you. you allow can i add something yeah sorry please go ahead yes please go ahead uh, ravi i just wanted to add something to this yeah please it's not that followers have a say in this that we do not 
we want uh, suppose ascot or brit to be the lead or not it's just the broker who decides that uh, he wants xyz company to become the leader and followers just agree whether they want to be a follower in the contract or not that's it followers do not have the right to say that we want to we want ha to have this as lead or not am i correct that's correct that's uh, yeah. very true as well you know yeah. um, so what meant was when when a broker is placing risk in the market right they know you know there are 10 uh, insurers or uh, syndicates or underwriters who can be leads right so they would you know share the risk information with you know whosoever they the broker deems uh, you know that the they, they could they would be able to write uh, you know underwrite that risk now it depends on the those underwriters as well as to who is able to uh, provide the best possible you know quote uh, to the under uh, to the broker right and that is where the broker would decide um, who to go ahead with and once he has got a underwrite leads you know uh, uh, terms and conditions then he would have followers uh, you know attached to that risk as well where followers decide, okay if they are okay to you know uh, sign up for that risk this is what has been you know uh, uh, decided by the uh, leader yeah sumanta so, if you can allow right. me just just wanted to add up one point here quickly and then we'll move forward yeah so basically we can also say that say for example sumanta talk about brit okay so maybe so brit is a expert in aviation and broker understand that brit can write aviation really well you know they have a right underwriters so now what we'll do broker broker will straight away go to the to the risk uh, to the brit saying that we have a aviation risk over here and this will also give a opportunity to uh, scott talbot and hiscox to a, to be a part of the risk though they don't have a expertise in writing aviation risk but since brit who is expert in writing aviation has already evaluated the risk accepted the risk then hiscock talbot and escort will also go with the thinking that okay if brit has accepted this means that the risk is good we can also go ahead and be a part of this risk so that we can also take some benefited out of you know brit underwriting and uh, get some underwriting uh, profit from it so this also this lead and follower you know situation will also give us a give a possibility for followers to learn uh, the underwriting the safe example it will also give talbot or escort uh, a, a perfect opportunity to learn about the aviation underwriting and plus they can also get a opportunity to earn some underwriting profit you know because they they trust brit underwriting to to underwrite the aviation risk correct samantha that's correct that's very well said you know that actually gives gives uh, other underwriters and syndicates to you know participate in risks where they are not an expert and eventually develop that expertise over a period of time yeah yeah okay so i'm moving ahead to the next slide yeah yeah so uh, we talked about the mrc or or the slip right uh, so mrc is is market reform contract and uh, mrc has got these six sections that you can see on the slide uh, brief history about mrc you know earlier uh, there was there, in the market there were not uh, you know, a, a standard format or standard document was not there uh, therefore there, there there used to be a lot of ambiguity uh, you know around the the insurance contract um where you know uh, at times or rather most of the time it led to lot of uh, uh, litigations because um uh, underwriters would not honor the the claim the the insured would feel cheated uh, and that was all because of this ambiguity that is when the market decided that you know to get rid of these kind of these issues uh they decided that you know uh, we will create a, a, a uniform uh document structure um which they called as market reform contract and uh, that and, and and it eventually uh, became the you know backbone of uh, capturing the risk details in the market right um when a risk is being placed in the market uh, since it uh, it is or placed on a subscription basis most of the time 
you know, uh, so initially uh, when the broker goes around uh, and meets a lot of underwriters, you know, and writers would <laughs> review the risk and would, uh, you know, um, put uh, the percentage of risk that they would want to assume, you know, and uh, and that is what, uh, and, and that is when, you know, they would uh, maybe, you know, write a percentage on the slave. And that that is called as a written line because that is what um, the writer uh, wants to you know assume the risk when uh, it gets found. And eventually, when the you know um, the risk is finally placed and it is firmed up and it, it is agreed between the insured and the market, uh, then it eventually becomes the signed line. And signed line is the final percentage uh, that uh, the underwriter would subscribe to in that particular risk. Uh, so this is the concept of written line and signed line. Uh, there's another concept where you know since uh, the broker is going um, you know um, going in the market and trying to place a risk and some lot of the underwriters are you know uh, putting in their lines of maybe you know certain percentage. At times the total percentage you know uh, may add up to more than hundred percent. And risk cannot be placed um, at a more than 100 percent you know basis so uh, that is where the broker has the authority to you know sign it down it is called signing down where the broker would reduce the signed lines uh, to the equal percentage of what uh, the uh, you know market participants or the underwriters have participated uh, in that particular risk Okay, so this is how you know uh, risk is uh, written, signed, and formed up, and at times signed, signed down as well. So all these informations would then get captured, and all the accounting would be done. This is what has been finally signed uh, by the underwriters. Okay, so with that, uh, let's move on to line slip now. Uh, line slip. So Mata, again, you know, and uh, everyone. Uh, there is a yeah. time check so we have uh, seven uh, to ten minutes more so safe example if we are going uh, slightly ahead of time people are free to drop off from this call we will share the recording on the youtube channel okay over to you samantha okay thanks Ravi. so when when the risks are you know not uh, slightly complex then you know probably it is better to you know uh, place them on a line slip basis and line slip is is essentially uh, initiated by the broker when the broker sees you know a certain kind of uh, risks are being placed a lot in the market or he is receiving certain kind of risk that needs to be placed in the market that is when he will approach the underwriters um, and would create a line slip you know uh, and line slip are a form of more delegated authority and uh, is one of the and, and uh, line slip is a contract that is put together by the insurance broker as i mentioned uh, the broker will approach a variety of insurers who are writing the same type of uh, business and ask them to uh, you know participate in that line slip uh, within the uh, line slip there is a there would again be a slip leader who would have the delegated authority from the other participants of the line slip? Um, again, the concept of uh, leaders and followers. And um, by participating in the line slip, the followers agree to the um, agree for the leader to write risk on their behalf. And uh, the benefit for the broker is that once the line slip is in place, instead of having to go to a lot of different insurers when looking to uh, insure for a client, looking to insure a client, they will only have to go to the slip leader who agrees on behalf of the followers, right? So this is the benefit of, of a line slip. Again, line slip uh, are of two types, uh, bulking and non-bulking line slip. A bulking line slip is when, you know, um, the premium for the individual declarations are combined or bulked together and and send for settlement to the underwriters so they'll uh, you know create a board row and send it through uh, uh, through to exchanging for uh, accounting and settlement but in case of a non-bulking line slip uh, each individual declaration uh, which attaches to the risk uh, has to be presented separately for for uh, accounting and settlement yeah
Um, so oh, we have already uh, talked in detail about the delegated authority. Delegated authority is where you know, the underwriter has uh, set up a cover holder to a binding authority agreement to uh, write just on their behalf. Now, in the binding authority agreement, it would be clearly called out as to what would be the reporting you know, uh, duration or reporting time for uh, the cover holders. So normally, cover holders would report uh, to their underwriters uh, uh, on a monthly or a quarterly basis through Bodro. So Bodro is nothing but you know amalgamation of all the risks that the cover holder would have written for that uh, you know uh, reporting period and you know and and would send it through uh, to the underwriters uh, for the underwriters to know as to how many risks has been written uh, by the cover holder on their behalf you know for accounting and settlement purpose uh, uh, whenever the cover holder would have collected uh, premiums for the uh, risk that they would have written on behalf of the uh, underwriter they would again amalgamate and create a paid board row or a premium board row which would have all the you know details of all the risks for which a premium has been collected and that premium now needs to be you know passed on to the underwriter so they would create those uh, premium board rows and send it uh, through to the broker broker would then you know uh, process those premium board rows and you know uh, through exchanging would settle the premium to the uh, underwriters okay All right, since uh, we have been able to successfully place uh, uh, open market insurance, uh, line set flip insurance, and uh, you know, both insurance in the market uh, or a delegated underwriting in the market, now let's look at claims. Uh, as everybody would agree, you know, claims plays a very, very important role, uh, or probably this is the most critical part of, of the insurance life cycle, right? If uh, a claim is not being honored, then probably insurance is of no use to anybody right so uh, lloyds uh, or rather london market uh, as, as a marketplace um, has uh, um, has always tried to be you know very fair and uh, have tried to pay claims very very promptly um, so all i mean the, their claims management performance is actually uh, measured on the base of or the parameter is, is how quickly are they able to settle claims to the clients and that is what every uh, insurer uh, these days are striving for uh, for multiple reasons here yeah. uh, and broker plays a very very important role uh, in, in the london market in terms of uh, you know uh, managing claims and settling claims as well right um, I think in, in the last session, Amit discussed about one of the uh, biggest claim that uh, Lloyd's uh, settled in the earlier days was uh, the Titanic uh, ship's claim, which was settled in 30 days from the date of loss. So uh, this is the kind of, you know, uh, attention uh, the claims, the market has towards you know, honoring claims. And these days, market is you know coming up with a lot of uh, innovation in order to make uh, the claim experience you know um, or improve the claims experience uh, uh, for the client. Okay, should we move to the next one, please? So uh, for open market and line slip uh, claims again, uh, you know, um, the broker would be notified by the insured about uh, a possible claim or the claim that uh, you know or, or the loss that um, would have occurred. And once a broker has been notified, broker buy and you know get further information. And in the meanwhile, also uh, you know create a claims uh, uh, transaction in their own uh, system of record and notify the uh, as well the way claims is being notified to the market is through a, a, a system called class uh, the broker would you know enter all the claims details information into the class system which would trigger an electronic claim file uh, to the underwriters now basis uh, you know the kind of uh, agreement 
there, there uh, it has been agreed between the underwriters and the uh, uh, broker uh, or within the underwriters as well uh, if if uh, the lead underwriter is allowed to you know um, take decision on claims on behalf of the followers as well uh, they would go ahead and look at the ecf they have received from the broker look at all the documents and they would decide either to you know accept or reject the claim if the claim has been accepted then the ecf file moves to the to exchanging which is exchanging claim services xcs and uh, they would process uh, the claims again they would follow their uh, checks and balances once they have agreed the claim the xcs has agreed the claim that claim amount that has been agreed by the underwriter would be deducted from the underwriter's account in three working days and would be paid to the broker once the broker has received the claim amount the broker would then settle it uh, to their clients yeah so this is how the you know end-to-end -end claims settlement works uh, in the london market it's it's a bit complicated and cumbersome to be honest but then yeah as i mentioned uh, the market is now looking at a lot of innovations to ensure that you know uh, the claims experience uh, becomes um, the, the clients have an improved claims experience in case of delegated authority claims again uh, the cover holder uh, would create the claims board rows uh, for the reporting period and it would consist all the claims that they have paid and all the claims that they have received and they would you know create this board row and, and send it uh, through to the broker the broker would do their you know um, processing checks and balances and uh, you know um, send the claim uh, to to the underwriter again uh, through their class uh, once underwriter receives it again it is the same process of you know uh, agreeing the ecf and then it goes to uh, exchanging exchanging uh, processes the claims and uh, the amount gets settled uh, through exchanging to the broker and broker eventually you know gives it back to the mm -hmm. Cover holder. Um, at times, you know, the cover holder. Uh, I mean, and the claims or or premiums are settled on a uh, you know a periodic basis, which is uh, as I mentioned, monthly or quarterly. At times, especially especially you know, uh, for example, when uh, we have these hurricane or natural calamities uh, uh, happening, maybe in US, there the you know cover holder cannot wait for for uh, you know uh, completing the reporting period and then create a board row claims board row and then you know uh, sending it uh, to the underwriter receiving the money and then paying out to the uh, client it it actually uh, would take almost a quarter's time but then you know the, if somebody is, has been hit or you know uh, has been affected due to a natural calamity the uh, the insurer the insured cannot wait so long so in those cases you know if the cover holder you know cannot settle the claim all by themselves because of sudden uh, increase in the amount of claims they are receiving they would raise something called cash call uh, cash call is is again uh, you know uh, a pot of money that they would be asking from the underwriters uh, you know and underwriters uh, would honor that um, on the basis that their cover holder would need to uh, uh, process claims on an urgent basis and this cash call is uh, is something that uh, would again be processed through brokers and ecf and, and exchanging and that helps the cover holder to settle claims on um, on an urgent basis if required and those are also again you know accounted for during the monthly or the quarterly claims board row so this is how the claims is being uh, processed and settled uh, in the london market um, yeah, so that's it from my end. Uh, over to you, Ravi. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Sumanta, so, thanks a lot. I mean, uh, we know that we are uh, slightly, you know, we have consumed our time uh, and we have uh, actually talked about it. We picked some questions, but still, you know, I just wanted to give uh, this opportunity to ask one or two questions to our audience so that we can take the few question and close this session so we have just five minutes with us so if anybody want to ask anything or say for a word of thanks to uh, to sumanta uh, you are you are most welcome
so thank you so much sumanta okay my pleasure buddy my pleasure thank you um i just uh, have a quick question so you mentioned about uh, the cover holder binding authority and the service companies i just wanted to know that is there any prerequisite to enter as a binding authority or cover holder or anybody anybody can just enter into the world of lloyds as a cover holder no no i mean not everybody anybody or everybody can be uh, you know cover holder um, for assuming the role of a cover holder uh, they have to go through uh, a uh, uh, lot of uh, requirements uh, from lloyds to become a cover holder and they, those are more around their experiences their their financial position uh, their ability to take decisions on behalf of the you know uh, the syndicates or the underwriters uh, so there are a lot of factors that needs to be considered before uh, lloyd grants uh, somebody this cover holder uh, you know uh, tag yeah so as of now i think there are 3950 odd cover there were 3950 or cover holders uh, lloyds approved cover holders um, as of uh, 31st of uh, december 2019 and they bring like close to 30 30% of the the entire london market business that's that's correct and and, and um, delegated underwriting is is a good way for reaching out to uh, to uh, the globe right yeah uh, lloyds would be able to uh, you know set up their operations or you know um, service companies uh, everywhere in the world so one of the easiest way of doing uh, business across the world is through uh, you know delegated underwriting yeah. they have this cover of the uh, corner of the world yeah i'm not going to hold uh, people for a longer time uh, uh, for this evening and we are almost uh, consumed our time so uh, thanks a lot sumanta for your valuable time and giving us insight about how the things really work in the market uh, what are the various processes and uh, for audience right if you have any questions so you can still send those questions to us this recording will be available on let's talk business youtube channel you can post your question over there we will answer your question there so that everybody who is watching this video presentation can have you know a, a clear understanding about what are the questions and how we have responded to those questions being said that finally uh, we have we have arrived to the end of this session thanks a lot sumanta once again and in future we'll have uh, this kind of a session where we'll have we'll pick some of the other subjects and we'll discuss more about it being said that thanks a lot thanks everyone for thank you that. so much thank you so thank much you, ravi thank you, thank you sumanta thank you. and thanks for explaining uh, explaining that thank you it thank was you. my pleasure bye bye yes, thank, thank you it was a very useful session thanks everyone thanks thank you thanks sumanta thanks ravi thank you very much thank you